with a um, abundance of examples uh, across cultures. Um, so it, it was a real pleasure uh, for uh, for our ears, but also for our eyes. And um, uh, now let me just in, intervene briefly to uh, uh, not only thank uh, Professor Bruno Suracha, but also to uh, thank Professor Marco Viola, who's gonna now uh, continue the presentation with a talk on the face and the mask a philosophical and cognitive perspective. You are going to realize that uh, here we have two different methodologies. Uh, as our research group is interdisciplinary, so uh, on the one hand, uh, a semiotics is predominant, but on the other hand, uh, we also have uh, other members of uh, the team and other scholars uh, who contribute to with their specific uh, methodology. In this case is the philosophy of the mind, the cognitive sciences, and a, a series of conferences that uh, Professor Makogoda has. Uh, so we're really delighted to um, uh, having you here uh, today, Professor Viola, and uh, the floor is, is yours. Uh, so thanks again for your participation. Thanks to you, Professor Leone, for your nice invitation. And thanks for Professor Suracha for heating up the audience with a very interesting and detailed presentation. And thanks to everybody for your patience in listening. Now, uh, as Professor Leone introduced, I come from a background in cognitive science and uh, philosophy of mind. And, but it is very stimulating to work on um, in the facet steam and all the project that i try to develop and that i will give you a glimpse about in these slides are quite new to me so let's start with something quite simple we all know pretty intuitively that the face is a person to word interface. Most of our sensory modalities, most of our sensory organs are located into the face. The face has eyes for seeing, ears for hearing, the nose for smelling, the mouth for tasting, and there is skin in the face, even if there is skin all over the body. So we also have optic sensations in the face that, so that we can perceive temperature, pain, and so on. And perhaps we can also go further. There is a constant exchange of air from the, the mouth or from the nostrils. So the face is really a hub where to speak metaphorically, persons trade information and little substances with the world. But that's not the only thing a face is. A face is also possibly the, the primary channel for social information exchange. Okay? This is a diagram I took from a paper on uh, social psychology they conceive a, with a bit of simplification that a face the face of the sender a is rich of information which gets visually decoded by a receiver b that means that the decoder is able to perceive or to infer and we will spend a few words about the difference between the two uh, words, many kinds of social information, okay? So just by seeing a face, I can determine, or at least guess, which is my, um, who I am speaking to, that is the identity of the sender her or his gender, age, ethnicity, physical health, 
her or his emotional state. I can, uh, uh, she or he may look more or less attractive. I can have an idea of what are some of her or his personality traits, whether she or he is trying to deceive me, whether she or he is rich or poor, trustworthy or unreliable, and so on and so forth. That is, there are plenty of social signals that we might draw. I have written, and I want to underscore, perceive or infer, because not all these signals are crystal clear. Actually, some of the information I can see on someone else's face are more prejudiced than actual truthful information. So we must uh, be cautious of not to interpret all the, the signals we draw from faces as reliable signals. But be them reliable or not, there is plenty, a lot of social information. So one important distinction that psychology and neuroscience uh, told us about is about the distinction between uh, at least two systems for processing facial information. Imagine that we are this uh, receiver. We see a face and the, the visual information, it's our retina, our eyes. From there, following this uh, crossing trip that is just sketchily represented in this picture, most visual information travels back to this part of the skull. Behind the skull, there is the occipital cortex, whose function is mainly that of process receiving and processing visual information. So that's where facial information or whatever visual information uh, first arrives. Well, then a part of this so visual information about faces is then sent to uh, an area, to many areas, but to a system that is mainly made up by this area called the fusiform face area that is specialized part of our brain for perceiving and recognizing faces. This system, which is mainly based in the fusiform face area, has the main task of uh, extracting the invariant aspects of faces to establish their identity. This happens mostly for faces we are familiar with, that is our parents' face, it's easier to detect and to recognize that unknown face we are better at recognizing our uh, same ethnic group faces than other ethnic group. In fact, you may think that I kind of resemble both uh, Professor Suraj and Professor Leone, if you're not familiar with us. Uh, and it can extract invariants no matter what are the expressions. As you can see, this guy in this picture has a the same face in three different facial expressions. But thanks to this system, we are able to recognize him nonetheless, to, to think he is the same guy because of his invariance traits of the face. On the other end, there is another system which is mainly, primarily based in the superior temporal sulcus that also gets information from the inferior occipital gyrus, from the visual cord, primary visual cortex. This system groups faces and analyzes faces based on uh, uh, dynamical information. That is, uh, according to this uh, uh, system that I have uh, just arbitrarily assigned a red color, we perceive sadness or uh, happiness on faces, no matter their identity. 
Okay, so this system is able, is along with other systems, the brain is very complicated. And here I am just trying to simplify uh, to a large extent, but this system studies the dynamic parts, whereas the other ones, the environment parts. And these two systems are largely independent. They're, they may interact, but each one has its business. Now, let's talk a little bit about the facial expression of emotion. This is a topic whose study is usually um, dated back to Charles Darwin's famous book, The Expression of the Emotions in Men and Animals. Okay, this uh, is the um, is, is not the most famous book of the father of the theory of evolution, but nonetheless, here it introduces this nice idea that is still very popular uh, and today that in a sense the facial expressions of emotion at least in some case are kind of universal or at least partially universal and they evolved twice why twice let me make this simple example we have this girl, which is, uh, she, her mood is neutral. She then saw a mushroom and she knows that this mushroom is poisonous. She then beca becomes disgust, okay? Disgust, according to the Darwinian tradition, not Darwin himself, perhaps, but those who make the study of emotion inspired by Darwin, this gas is the emotion whose function is to uh, avoid bad chemicals, to avoid pathogens. And this is the reason why when we are disgusted by a bad smell or seeing something creepy and distasteful, we are like, we wrinkle our nose, we close the mouth. And the reason, according to some psychologists, is that uh, we want to minimize the air intake. We kind of close the gate to our body. It's okay. So this is the first evolution, the part in which a facial movement evolved to do something that is related to my own survival. Okay, a kind of instinctual behavior. But then there is a second part. Emotions are also for communication. Imagine that the second girl that is not as skilled as the first one in mushroom science, she sees the mushroom. She doesn't know that it is poisonous. And she thinks, oh, how nice, so red. Well, looks juicy. Shall I eat this mushroom? Hmm, why not, why not? But then she glances, she sees that the other girl is disgusted and by means of emotional contagion, because we tend to um, implicitly and involuntarily mimic other people's facial expressions, in, in many cases, she tend to assume the same uh, facial expressions and she gets the hint that perhaps this mushroom is not to be taken. So in this sense, it is said that emotions like disgust evolved twice. First time for protecting myself and the second one to communicate to someone else that something is disgusting so that she or he can protect herself or himself too. Now, we will see this double function even when we switch the topic from the face to the mask let's do this what is a mask in my work in in the chapter in the writings i will draw from this presentation i will try to provide a philosophical definition of mask when you try to give a philosophical definition you cannot just rely to vocabularies, because the vocabularies are 
they are nasty. Common language is very uh, anarchic. It goes all the way and it gets words in uh, vocabulary, gets meaning by means of accidental uh, uh, chances. They are hardly translate. It's hard to translate from language to another without some loss of meaning. So what I'm rather trying to do is to start with vocabulary definitions of mask and then to propose a more scientific definition, which defines mask in relation to the face. But not don't, let's don't make spoiler. According to the Cambridge Dictionary, a mask is a covering for all or part of the face that protects, hides, or decorates the person wearing it. It's okay. We'll go back to the other definition later. So let me ask the help of philosophers of technology. One of the most important notion in philosophy of technology is the notion of artifact that is, uh, well, let, let me draw the definition of artifact from the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, a very useful open and free online resource for um, philosophical definitions and, and a good introduction to many philosophical topics. According to the Stanford Encyclopedia, artifacts are objects, as in this case, uh, stone age spear, made intentionally, and you can see the, in this example, the caveman making the spear, in order to accomplish some purpose, and in this case, to go hunting. Okay. Now, I choose this example with the caveman to underscore that artifacts are as old as human civilization. We make a large use of tools and man-made objects. Among these, masks. Now, in artifacts, the function that we want them to play, the task that we, we want the objects to play, determines in the mind and in the hands of their creator, their form. And the form and the alleged function together determine their identity. What I mean is, if we want an artifact for sitting, we build a chair so that it is uh, solid enough to bear our weight. We do not call a chair chair because it's blue or green or made of wool or iron. We call chair, we typically call chair whichever object that has the function of let a single person sit on it. Okay? That means that the essence of an artifact is the function that the creator wants that artifact to play. Is it clear until now? Can you confirm? Thank you. Okay. So, what is the what are the functions of masks? Because we have seen that by building masks with a certain function in mind the creators of masks kind of determine their essence. Covering for all parts of the face that protects, hides, or decorates. Okay, so that's the function of the masks with respect to face. So that people cannot see who you are or so that you look like someone or something else. Or to protect you from the germs or harmful substances to conceal one's identity. Masks have many functions. They are artifacts with many functions, all related to protecting the face, either in the sense of uh, preventing some trade-off with the word, or to prevent some trade-off in terms of social information. This is the simple part. Now, let me begin with the funny 
and, and most complicated part, which is also stimulating. The point is that one mask never does a single thing because the, the face is a very important, a very crowded part of our body. We do a lot of things with faces, willing or not. So for instance, let's take this example. I hope that at least some of you is familiar with this superhero. It's uh, Spider-Man. Uh, it's uh, a superhero created by the um, U.S. Uh, comic artist Stan Lee. And he's, it, he used to be a journalist called Peter Parker. And then he got um, uh, bitten by a radioactive uh, spider and got superpowers. And it, well, I mean, it's a classical superhero story. Now, in order not to spoil his career as a journalist, you don't want people to know that you have a spider superpower, Peter Parker decided to wear a mask. And the mask has two purposes. The first one is to conceal Peter Parker's identity. But there is another effect of the mask that is to get another identity. So masks are never just a barrier. They do not just conceal the identity, or as we will see, the facial expressions and all their meaning, they also bring some meanings on their own, which is, uh, now that we can, which is the reason why psychologists and neuroscience cannot do the study of masks on their own, but they need disciplines such as anthropology or semiotics especially to interpret this positive side of masks and their meaning, because this is culturally mediated. Another funny fact, artifacts can have many functions, and we will see how many in the case of masks, but usually when they are created, we are created with a single or a single set of functions in mind, which we call in philosophy the proper function. The proper function of an iPad is, among the others, being able to read PDFs and EPUBs and other common uh, stuff, which is read, read on, on the iPad. But you can also use the iPad in less orthodox ways. Let me show you with this uh, nice video. This girl, uh, has uh, given her dad an iPad and he, he very much appreciated the gifts, the gift, but that's how he is using the iPad. <laughs> she is a bit disappointed about this, but he just uses this iPad as a cutting board in kitchen. I mean, why not? It's, it has the right size uh, and it's hard, so yeah, that's a system function, we can say, of the iPad. But apart from this joke, there are plenty of system functions everywhere. Uh, we have chairs, we typically sit on chairs, but if we need to climb um, to get something that is too high on a cupboard, we use chairs for climbing rather than for sitting. And in any case, these system functions, let's just call them secondary functions or derived functions, they are pervasive in the philosophy, in, in, in artifacts, okay? Now, let's speak about this mask. This mask is a baklava. Is Its proper function is meant to be that of preventing the cold to freeze our face. If you have to go to the mountains, like our colleague Antonio Santangelo often does, you will meet him in a few days, he, he brings with himself one of these, uh, these masks made of wool. The main purpose of this mask, according to those who create and sell this mask, is to protect us from the cold. But, there is a but, this mask accidentally also prevent our identity and 
facial expressions to be seen. This is then the reason why uh, one may also buy and wear a baklava to go uh, doing some robbery because you cannot recognize her or him with such a full face mask. It's okay. And this was not the first reason why this mask was built, although some robber may buy the mask for this reason. And then the moral of this story is that it's never so simple as philosopher may like it to be to determine which is the primary function, the proper function, and which, is, which are the secondary ones. Because I bet that when you first saw this mask, you probably first thought about robbing a bank than going to the mountains. So the, the functions may evolve. Now, I see a parallel here between facial expressions and masks because facial expressions as we have discussed evolved uh, twice the first time to perform an action for the survival of my own organism and the second one to communicate someone else something about uh, an emotion and to aid her or him in her or his survival and the mask evolved uh, as the two, two functions at least, but there are many more. These, they, in this case, these were initially a protective mask for the purpose of defending ourselves from the cold, but then it gets reused, re-employed for protecting the identity. Fine? Now, uh, this idea inspired me during the lockdown to do some psychological studies that I will present very briefly. Uh, we were not used to see the medical face masks very often before the pandemic, but then they became pervasive. Okay. So inspired also by some discussions with Professor Leone, I realized that, yes, the proper function of these masks is that to protect ourselves and especially others from, well, in this case, uh, SARS-CoV-2, but many other pathogens. It's okay. This was the primary function of, of these masks. But as you may, might expect, and perhaps you noticed even before this, this, this lecture, masks have also other function. This is a vignette that I find very funny from an Italian comic artist called Altan. There is this guy coming back home from work or whatever, and he finds his wife uh, in bed in intimacy with another man. And she claims, sorry, I thought it was you, because that man wears the face mask. Now, this is uh, meant to be uh, um, ironic, but the point here is that, as a matter of fact, it is possible that by seeing someone with a face mask, you can uh, be, it is harder to recognize her or his identity. See? Well, but this is not joke, putting the jokes apart. This is not the only side effect, not the only secondary and undesired, perhaps, function of the face mask. Another function was found in Hong Kong uh, seven years ago in this uh, study that, to, put, to make a, a long story short, finds that the primary care doctors who visited patients with face masks after the first SARS uh, pandemic in Hong Kong were perceived as less empathic. That is, patients went, went to the doctor and if the doctor had this face mask, the patients felt that they were cared less. 
in sense. But also think about death and art of hearing the people. They read uh, they, their verbal communication is mainly based on a, on a lip reading, or they also use uh, the signal language, which is made made both by hand gestures and by mouth gestures. Okay, so what happens if you cover the mouth because of face mask? For deaf people, or people who cannot hear, this was a tragedy in the tragedy because by seeing everybody with face masks, they became unable to communicate. A dear friend of mine working in a psychiatric structure told that a, a deaf uh, patient, okay, a, a person who cannot hear, turned mad and became violent because he was unable to see the lips of people when they wore masks and he got paranoid. So it's a serious issue. To face this problem, many countries from China to US and even in Italy invented various sorts of transparent masks. Transparent masks are meant to let the mouth visible. So in a sense, if the functions of a mask was to protect, there was no need to keep this part uh, uh, invisible. You can have a transparent material and the function, while, uh, as you might now have, have understood, while uh, some tools, some artifacts are built with a specific purpose in mind, they often have many other functions and effects. And this is particularly true when the, the face is involved, because as you have seen also from Professor Suraja's uh, slides, the face is a very relevant part of our body where many things happen. So we ran an experiment with some colleagues of mine. Bruno, do you think that we, I still have three or four minions? Of course you have, you can okay. go. We run this experiment. We, we were in lockdown, so no laboratory experiment, but we did an online survey, a very simple survey. We showed people 48 images from this database from where I took most of the faces I showed you. And these faces often had some emotional expression. For instance, this is the fear expression this girl is uh, is in a fearful state or she pretends to be uh, to to be experiencing fear but the first group saw all the faces with no masks the second group with transparent masks and the third group with standard masks and we were and we then asked them see this uh, fixation cross to get their eyes straight on one point see the face depending on which group the face with or without masks and then tell us which emotion do you see in the face and how trustworthy you think this face is because we were interested in knowing as we hypothesize if people recognize fear quite well, easily when there is no mask, but they failed to recognize fear when there is some mask. And the most interesting case was the transparent mask. Do they have an hard time? Is it difficult for them to recognize fear? Our preliminary results or well, and we also also asked them, do you um, have you seen this phase before that is in the second part of the experiment? we showed everybody just 12 faces. Four of them were already seen in the previous part, but this time, no matter which group they belong to, the faces were all without masks. Why? Because we were interested in knowing if you first meet someone with a mask, are you able to recognize her or him as soon as he or she is without mask? And the results 
in brief, are for the four emotions we test, that is no emotion, happy emotion, sad emotion, fear emotion, having a standard mask make, makes it harder, not incredibly, but significantly harder to recognize whether someone has this emotion or not. The only exception being neutral faces. Neutral faces were always perceived, perceived as such with 90% accuracy, which is a lot. But said faces with standard masks were very hard to recognize. The accuracy fell to 70%. Uh, you see, sad and fe fearful faces were often confused. The interesting thing, though, was that transparent mask was uh, almost unimpaired. I mean, people were as good in seeing emotion in transparent masks as they were in seeing emotion without mask. So even though transparent masks were invented to, to allow the communication of art of hearing, they also allow unexpectedly to the ideators the communication of emotion in all people. But that's not the same for standard masks, of course. And another interesting fact is that this guy is often perceived to be untrustworthy. Perhaps it looks mean, I don't know, but the fact is that in a score from zero to seven, the mean score when there was no mask was less than two. It is very untrustworthy. But if you give him a, a transparent or even better a mask, people tend to perceive and to rate him as a little more trustworthy. So in a sense, we can think that mask uh, uh, prevent untrustworthiness to be shown, okay? And finally, about identity, we have confirmed that if uh, while people were able in the 80 something percent of the case to recognize whether they had seen a face before, if they first met them without mask, if they have to see her or him without with, with some mask, either a standard or a transparent mask, and then this person is met again without mask, this person is, um, is, is hardly recognized as such. That is, the accuracy drops a bit. Now, these are preliminary results, and we want to investigate many more things because masks have also cultural significance that we are willing to investigate. But for now, they might be suggesting that masks do a lot of things, and we want these functions to be investigated along with the functions they were uh, projected for. Let me thank uh, Massimo Leone, uh, Roberto Gamboni, and Bruno Suraj and the other members of the BASIS team, and also the psychologists who did this experiment with me, Fausto, Mark, and Alessandro, and Fabio. This is my mail if you have some questions. Thanks. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Marco, thank you for your really relevant presentation, uh, uh, which uh, introduced us uh, from a psychological, philosophical, and neuroscientific point of view to this uh, very significant, very contemporary theme of the mask. And I think your the, the final experiment uh, you, you showed us uh, uh, can uh, give us uh, uh, really significant results. I also I would also like to thank uh, all the audience. Uh, unfortunately, we have no time for any questions. So thank you, thank you all. We hope to see you in person as soon as possible. A good night, uh, and thank you very much for your attention. And of course, thank you, Massimo, Professor Massimo Leone, for <clears throat> the organization of this symposium. Thank you, and uh, goodbye. Bye bye.